this video we're going to talk about one dimensional steady state heat conduction with thermal energy generation. Many applications are concerned with systems in which heat is generated internally. We see a generation term in our energy balance and heat diffusion equation. The E dot gen term is the rate of energy generation in terms of watts. The Q dot term in the heat diffusion equation is the volumetric heat generation term and it's E dot gen divided by the volume. Where might we see thermal energy generation within a solid? Nuclear reactors, systems involving resistive heating, and systems involving exothermic or endothermic chemical reactions are good examples. Let's talk for a second about how you can handle resistive heating. The rate of heat generated due to resistive heating is the current in amps squared times the, the electric resistance, which is in ohms, and those units will give you watts. You can also relate that to the volumetric heat generation rate. Now let's first talk about the thermal gener energy generation in a plain wall. Figure 3.10 in your book shows several possible temperature profiles that you might see in such a case. The first case, case A, involves two different convective coefficients on either side. The heat transfer rate at the right face is higher than the heat transfer rate on the left face, the, so the temperature TS2 is lower than TS1, and the maximum temperature is somewhere in between, a little left of center, as we would expect. Um, the other two examples we're going to group together. At the top, case B, we have the same boundary condition on either side, so the surface temperature is the same on both sides. And as we would expect, the temperature is the highest in the middle, since the heat is being generated uniformly and we have the same rate of re heat removal on both sides. So, our temperature profile has sort of a parabolic shape. At the very top is the apex of that curve, and that occurs at the middle at x equals zero, and at that apex, the slope of the curve is zero. So, according to Fourier's law, if we evaluate the heat transfer at the middle at x equals zero, we'll see that the heat transfer rate is zero. You may remember us uh, talking um, about thermal symmetry in video 2.4, where we talked about an adiabatic surface. And what this means is at, if the actual physical scenario is case B, we can use case C to accurately solve for the temperature distribution. The temperature profile is a mirror image about the middle. Why would we do this? Because sometimes it makes the math, math easier and we all like when that happens. Let's take the more general case for thermal energy generation, case A, where we have non-symmetrical convection on either side. Here's our heat conduction equation. Let's say these are our boundary conditions. Now you might not know the surface temperature, maybe you only know the convective conditions on either side, that could be your boundary condition, but we'll, call, we'll solve for the specific case of knowing the surface temperatures. So if we assume the conduction is steady state and one dimensional, our differential equation simplifies, and then it's time to multiply each side by dx and integrate. C1 is our constant of integration, we multiply each side by dx and integrate again, and finally, we obtain the general solution for our differential equation. We apply boundary condition number one and get an equation. Then we apply boundary condition number two and get another equation. We have two equations and two unknowns, so we can solve these simultaneously. Then you can substitute, oops, you can substitute in your equation for C1 into one of those equations up there, and then you can solve for C2. And now we have a nice, clean, well, sort of, expression for the temperature distribution. Let's take this special case where TS1 and TS2 are equal. And let's take advantage of the fact that we have thermal symmetry. What you see is our boundary condition has changed so that we have no heat transfer at x equals zero. Note that since we've already solved for the general solution to the temperature distribution, we don't need to do it again. We apply the first boundary condition and get this equation. Then we apply the second, and we remember that we've already solved for dt dx when we were obtaining the general solution before, and we get that C2, uh, C1 is equal, and we can use that to solve for C2. 
and we finally get the equation for the temperature distribution. Keep in mind that this solution is applicable to either case B or case C shown in the picture. Now let's take the case of a cylinder. So say that cylinder is long enough so that we can ignore the temperature variations at the end, and that way we can approximate it as one dimensional. The thermal conductivity is constant. We could divide through by the thermal conductivity, and then we multiply each side by dr and integrate. C1 is our constant of integration. Then we divide through by r and multiply each side by dr and integrate. <clears throat> and now we have the general solution for T as a function of R. The first boundary condition is the symmetry condition. And the second can be either a prescribed surface temperature or a flux. Um, we could go through the same process as before to solve for those constants of integration, which will depend, of course, on the other boundary condition. Uh, but we'll save that for some problems that we go over in class. Well, I hope that was helpful. Thank you for watching.